Okay, it says it's live on my side. All right, let's do this thing. I'll kick it off. Awesome. I see a few people on the YouTube live. I wanna know where you guys are from. Post in the chat where you guys are tuning in from. Hey, everybody who's rolling in. There's a music in the background. Are you hearing that? I don't hear music, no. <laughs> okay. Wonder why I do. Okay, it's gone now anyways. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Like Dara said, let us, let us know where you're, where you're tuning in from. Awesome. Baltimore, Mexico. I, not many people know this, but I actually spent a, an entire year of the pandemic living in Mexico. I was in Merida and I've also visited Mexico several times, uh, particularly Mexico City. So um, I have a lot of love for Mexico. Cairo, Egypt. Okay, I also lived in Egypt for two years. Not many people know that either. <laughs> You're so well-traveled, taken off. You were in Mexico before it was cool and it just started getting taken over. You're making things happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see um, someone else from Brooklyn. I'm also living in Brooklyn right now. <laughs> Brooklyn stand up, Toronto stand up. We see it in the building. Um, for anyone who's tuning in from YouTube, I'm going to post in our chat here just a link to Slido. This is where we're going to be managing all of our questions that come in that Dara is just going to bless us with the answers for. So that's what we got going on. <laughs> cool. 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 Awesome. And as we're, as we're letting more people jump in and let me just make sure that the chat is actually active here. Um, I'm getting notes. Hey everyone. If you see it in the chat on zoom of those of you who are there, just let me know. Give me a good. Hi, hi. How's it going? And then you can go ahead and throw in like where you're coming in from. I can only do it to hosts and panelists on zoom, but I see my YouTube people over here. Yeah, I see YouTube. <laughs> but for some reason, panelists and attendees, everyone should be able to access the chat now, just on the Zoom side too. Oh, hey, everybody. Sorry about that. There, there we go. We go. <laughs> got you. Got you. Now we got everyone tapping in YouTube-wise. Got them on the got them on the Zoom side. We are excited to be here today. Um, and ultimately for today, we have all of those great questions that we wanna get answers to. Um, and then where we'll, where we'll really, really start to see the shine is like once I share my screen and we get to those questions, please, please, please everybody, if you can, if you do have any questions, whether it's coming in from YouTube or on the Zoom side, throw them into our Slido. So I'll throw it into our Slack on Zoom too. So we can start building those up, up. And of course, use the upvoting section. If there are any questions that resonate with you that you might not have ideas around. Awesome, everybody. Cool. So without further ado, because we do have so many questions, let's jump into things here, everyone. So where I'm gonna kick us off now is I'm gonna share my screen. And welcome to the event. So uh, we're, we're excited to kick off here at Motion with Dara just on this AMA. She's dropped some amazing content recently around creative strategy and she's been doing so many great things over the past couple of years. So really excited to be with her here today and just starting to, to go through these questions. And before we get to those questions, I just wanted to give a quick update to everyone to kind of level set on the motion side of what we're all about before we hear all from Dara. So on the motion side, what we are all about is just the creative and analytics reporting. And we like to call ourselves the creative strategist hub. And essentially what that means is for everyone here, I know you know all about it. This is all about how do we make creative the most important lever that it already has post iOS 14 and everything in between. And where motion focuses as I go through a little bit of lag on my computer here. Uh, You're all good on my side, so I'm all good on your going. side. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So where we get where we get the just basically outside of the creator economy and outside of the most important lever being Facebook, uh, being the actual creatives, is on our end. We ultimately know that there are two types of teams, and what Dara is going to outline today. We have the creative side of things, and then we have the performance marketing side of things. And it's all about how we bridge that gap together. And at Motion, how we help do this is we make it easy to analyze. We make it then easy to visualize those types of creative findings. And ultimately what we're doing is we're making it easy to share in between teams. So with all of that being said, the quick housekeeping rules that I wanna give in, everybody's heard me say this, but please, please, please throw your questions into Slido if that's going on. 
There's going to be a recording of the event, whether it be through YouTube or on the Zoom side, we're gonna share it after. So everyone who's registered and everyone who's here, you'll get that good old recording. And then just from a motion end, if those of you are interested, feel free to just jump in. We have a 10% off using Dara's code of Dara D. So that's what we got going on. And without further ado, we can now talk about the amazing woman we are here with today. And this is Dara. So Dara is the Senior Director of Performance Creative at Thesis. She is a uh, full-time Senior Director of Performance Creative, part-time YouTuber. You know and love her all so well. She's done amazing, amazing things for so many different brands, whether it started out from just like copywriting to media buying, but she's been in this game for a long time and now really killing it on the creative end. But my favorite thing about Dara is just, she's just such a nice person. Like in all honesty, from every single conversation I'll have with her, I feel like I learned some stuff. So it's really, 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 uh, I'm really grateful to have her here today to go through this. So please be sure to go ahead and give her a follow if you're not already. And then let's get into the good stuff. And let's Dara, you have a couple words you wanna say to the people who are here to see you. No, just thank you so much for everyone that has joined us today. I'm always really amazed when I see you guys commenting on my videos, adding me on Twitter, because um, really my whole impetus behind creating this kind of content is I really just wanted to create content for the media buyer and the founder who didn't know where to start. Um, so as always, like my main driver for doing this kind of content and these lives are, are for you. So, um, and I wouldn't be here without any of you. So thank you so much for joining us today. It means a lot to me. Love it. Okay. So now what we can do here is we want to get over to these questions that everyone has asked and has really started upvoting. But what I'd love to do first is actually set the stage. So like I said before, Dara has made some great content, but Dara, I'm wondering if you could let the people know, like, what is creative strategy? And we can start there. Does that sound good? Yeah, of course. So for me, creative strategy is everything that happens before the actual execution or cre like creation of the ad creative. And it's so funny. I actually had this question um, pointed at me yesterday in the meet in a meeting that I was in um, with some of our counterparts at BMG, and I was like, you know you know, creative strategy is going to be the most important part of this. And we don't really have the bandwidth for it. And that team was like, well, what is creative strategy? And for me, that's really the research and the overall um, management of what the ad creative is going to be. But it's really that research portion of it that I think is the most important. Mm, so interesting. So interesting. And then we've heard a lot about like the buzz term of creative strategy, but then more importantly, like, this role that's starting to develop being a creative strategist. I know in your video, you talk about what that means at thesis, but for everybody here, can you talk about what it means to be a creative strategist as well? Yeah, so just to, to sum it up in like a simple, like one sentence, a creative strategist decides what ad creative to create next. They're the people that are going to own the strategy portion of it. So they're going to own the research. They're going to own the pipeline and execution of the ad. So they might not actually be the one executing or like editing the video, but they are going to be the one who's going to pair the video or the asset with the right type of creator. So maybe it should go to a graphic designer or maybe it should go to an editor. A creative strategist is the one that really needs to know that. And a creative strategist is also going to be the person who ultimately does the QA on the ad and decides mm -hmm. if it's actually ready to not only go to final client approval, but also ready for the ad platforms or whatever platforms that it's ready to be deployed on. It's so interesting. It makes a lot of sense too, especially the new world we are in. And then after describing that role, how do you think it differs from like a media buyer at this point? Well, I think that for a long time, most businesses and even agencies sort, sort of thought that media buyers could be the creative strategist. But as the demand for more, not only more creative, but better creative um, started to increase, like I think that what we learned at Thesis pretty quickly was that these roles needed to be separated. It was way too much for one person to manage solely. So at Thesis, like we really do have these divided up and we also have more senior um, creative strategists. So the way that it works at Thesis is you can become a creative strategist, then you can become an associate creative director, and then you can be a creative director, which really is that um, senior creative leadership, AKA visionary that oversees the entire creative process for our clients or book of business. Mm, okay. Gotcha. Love it. And then right now, like with all these different insights you have and eloquently worded statements just around creative strategy and creative strategists on the flip side of things, I saw a question that came in here, but it's like, what are the most common misconceptions you actually find about creative strategy? 
I'm just going to throw this one out here immediately and it's that you don't need it. Um, mm -hmm. I have definitely had pushback from not only clients, but also uh, like team members or um, just other people that are really skeptical about needing to do that much research. I think a lot of times there's this ethos or thought process that's like, oh, we really don't know what works on these platforms and we have to throw everything against the wall and just see what sticks. But there's actually just a major need of all the research that goes into creating these like winning ads, so to speak. So I, I think that really it all starts and begins with the creative research process. And from there just kind of, you know, goes more into the pipeline and then the actual like creation of these ads. Yeah. And then, sorry, everybody, I'm going to be selfish here, but something I've wondered about a long time, Dara, mm -hmm. is more importantly for yourself. You have such like a wide range of experience ultimately touching ads, right? And with creative strategy being somewhat of a new concept, how did you start determining like what to do first, what to do second, what to do third, and all the different steps there? I, I mean, it was a lot of trial and error. I'm not going to lie. Like our process at Thesis, it's not perfect yet. And we're editing it and making adjustments to it every single day. So, but I, I'd say really like knowing that, I mean, I've just seen it so many times, right? Like when we onboard a new client, there's always this immediate feeling of, oh my gosh, like, what are we going to do? Like, where do we start? And <laughs> it's, I've found that it's actually a lot easier to take a step back and be like, you know what? We don't have to have the award-winning creative right now. What we actually need to do is take a look at their analytics. What have they run before? What do those hook and hold rates look like? What are the ads that are driving the best performance? And then once we have that information, we go into, well, what does the reputation look like of this brand? What type of press hits do they have? How do their customers talk about them? Not only on social media, but also in the press or in like bigger review style blogs. And then it's also a the time to be like, well, what, what are their competitors saying? What are other big giants in the industry or their industry? What type of ad creatives are they running? How are they communicating to their customers? And I often find that once you're able to look into those action items, the idea of what type of creative is going to win here actually becomes a lot more, um, a lot more clear, at least where to begin and where to start creating that uh, creative roadmap. That's awesome. And especially when we talk about like where to begin, I think that's a great segue just to get to like the most upvoted question that we see here, right? So the most upvoted yeah. question is how do you structure your creative and ideation process, especially when working with such a large team? Where do you start? What does that flow look like? Cool. Well, what I'm going to ask you, Evan, is actually if I can share my screen a little bit. Oh, yeah. Now, I know that I had shared some documents in the video that I did with you guys. And I actually just want to give like, I'm just going to like really open the hood and let you guys see like exactly like what we're doing at Thesis. Now, what I'm showing you guys right now is actually a version of our creative kickoff template. So this is really like taking a step back, like when you first start working with us, like, hey, this is what it looks like. So like we have the initial like creative kickoff call. We have the creative strategy research, which I'm gonna dive to in a second. Then we develop the initial creative roadmap. Then we submit that creative roadmap to the clients. Then we onboard for UGC and studio. And then first creatives are gonna be delivered three to four weeks after this call, right? But it's really the first step is the creative strategy research. Now, I know a lot of you saw this document that I created. And this is not a special document. This is a Word document. It's not beautiful. I am working on like transferring this into something that is more of a slide deck form because I think that that's what everyone wants to see. And it's a lot prettier, especially when showing it to clients. But this is really how I guide my research process. So here we have an overview where we can link to like the planning and onboarding document, kickoff, brand guideline infos, ad library library, asset library. And then that's when we start to research. So we start looking at press, we start looking at socials. And what I'm also doing here, like when I'm looking at these things like socials is I'm making notes, I'm making comments like, oh, I keep on seeing this question popping up on their TikTok comments. Maybe there's something to explore there. Or, oh, I always notice that they use like this sort of tone when communicating with people on Instagram. Maybe that's something that we should look into further. Then we start diving into review sites, into customer reviews. And a lot of times I'm extracting not only the 
positive ones where I'm like, oh, wow, like that's really interesting. That could be a really cool angle. Um, but also the negative ones, because I also think that there's a lot to be said about creating content that is like um, handling objections. After that, we're going to look at competitor brands. So we're going to be linking out to all those ad libraries so that we can immediately access them. I'm also going to be looking at the landing pages and the overall websites that they're linking out to and their creatives, because that's also a really important part of the process that I feel like a lot of times media buyers or creative strategists just totally miss because a lot of times we're thinking so much about just the ad creatives. Now, this is something that I've added more recently, which is just use cases versus demographics versus awareness. So what I like to do here is like think about common use cases for the product. Now, this might be really obvious, especially if you're like a jewelry brand, for instance. Now, I saw a lot of people in the comments section asking about what I thought about jewelry brands. Now, of course, like the idea is like, oh, you wear it so that you feel good, look pretty. But I think like what some of the best jewelry brands do is like, oh, like, I wear this because I know I can wear it to the gym. I can wear it swimming. I can wear it showering. Like those are things that you want to highlight for use cases. Um, and then for demographics, it's like, who is that? Who is actually like buying your product? What are their age? Where do they live? Like, what is their education level? What is their income level? All of that stuff should go into the multiple demographics that you're ideally targeting. The other thing too is like awareness level. So this is a little bit nuanced, but it's thinking about like what awareness levels do your customers have of not only their problems, but the potential solutions that they have. So again, thinking about this jewelry brand person, like maybe they're already super aware of your brand, like Majuri, and they just need to get over that hump and they just need to know that they're making the right investment in your brand. So testimonials about why Majuri is the best are probably gonna be something that you should look into. But if they don't actually know of your brand, and yet, then those are the type of like, those are the type of places where you could think about like, oh, like maybe they get like green stuff on their ears when they're wearing like normal jewelry. That's something that you can then highlight in your ad because of their awareness level of that problem. Now, of course, like beyond that, we're going into the creative audit. And then we're also diving a little deeper into hook rates and hold rates. So I know that was a lot, but, and, and if you guys want, let me know in the comment section, we are happy to like send over that little template creative strategy workbook. So I know a number of you had mentioned it. So if you signed up for this, be sure to just like keep a lookout for your email box and we can like send that to you guys on email. Cause again, I don't think it's anything super special, but um, I would be happy to share that with you to help guide your strategy research. The, the people have definitely been asking, even in the chat, to be like, is this going to be made available? Are we going to get this? So that's Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thing that I really love about your process is like, even with those first initial steps, when we look at, as I go back to sharing my screen to those questions here, even when we see this next question of where do we start conducting the initial creative research, you tackle that too, right? That's where we start. That's where I start. Because you, you should not feel like you have to have all the answers. Like the first time that you are speaking with a client, onboarding the client, it is all a process. So, but I do find that like having that document it's just, it provides me like a lot of comfort as well, because again, you don't have to start with the award-winning creative just yet, but you just, you have to have a roadmap. You have to have a plan. And that strategy workflow helps me get that plan. Love that. And then the one follow-up question that I have is I really like that all of the different steps that you have actually are looking at to see in the world, how are people speaking about a specific brand yeah. more than anything, right? But then there's also that like, common part of what does the brand think about themselves and that element which How is often different than the way that your customers think about you talk about I that talk about that yeah. yeah i mean i think this is one of the bigger like discussions that i have to have with brands especially ones that like demand a certain level of scale in a, in a smaller amount of time which is like you know as like a performance creative strategist, like I'm looking at what the masses are gonna say and frankly, like what I think is gonna make you the most money. And a lot of times that goes against brand guidelines, which is a hard pill to swallow sometimes with brands. And I found that honestly, like I just have to be straight with brands and encourage them to step outside their comfort zones. I'm never gonna do anything or post anything um, creatively on an ad platform that I think is going to be damaging. But I think that from the brand perspective of what damaging is, is just like, it's very safe. It's very safe. Right. So 
I, I don't know. I could talk a lot about this subject, but I don't actually feel like I'm going to say anything definitive other than it is sort of like a brand marketing versus performance marketing, like kind of conversation. <laughs> yeah. But I think you said the most important part, right? As long as it's not damaging to the brand, then it's something yeah. that we might be able to just trade off. It's like, it's making enough money. So like, let's just keep doing it. We're not hurting us too bad at this point. Yeah. Dialogue, right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and then one of the other questions that I actually saw just talking about research, I have to go ahead and find it here, but there's someone that mentions, uh, Darren, in this case, if you're someone in the role of a media buyer or account management oriented role, what are some ways that we can make this research process more effective? Or oh, efficient? goodness. Sorry, not even effective. What efficient. are some ways we can make the research process more efficient? Um, number one, just do it. I, I like I know I said this earlier, the biggest barrier that I find people have is that they don't believe that they need it or that it seems superfluous or that they're never going to refer back to it. I can assure you, number one, that you will refer back to it. And I can assure you, number two, that you absolutely do need it. Um, but I think that what I've found more recently at Thesis is that if you can make the research process collaborative too, um, and collaborate with different team members, whether that be a media buyer and a video editor, that actually opens up a lot more perspectives instead of it just living in like a certain department silo. I really do encourage multiple departments to not only, um, you know, obviously review these type of documents, but take part in that research process themselves, because they're going to look at that data differently. They're going to also, they're just going to have a different perspective on it overall. A video editor is going to look at this kind of stuff and be like, oh, like I can actually take that kind of information about the way that customers are looking um, or communicating about this product. And this is how I can like talk about it visually. This is how I can talk about it in certain messaging points throughout like a video. A media buyer is going to see that and be like, oh, you know what? I've noticed that across other accounts, this type of messaging is actually what prevails. So that's something that we should really like hone in on and prioritize. And, you know, a creative strategist or creative director is going to look at it completely differently. So I think really the most of like, the more perspectives that you can get on this, the better. Um, and this is also gonna also like, and you know, this is also sort of a nuanced funny thing, but also just like look at the makeup of your, um, like of your departments and of the people doing that, um, that type of research. I've, I've found more recently where I'm like, uh, like I wish I had like more, more female voices or more like POC voices to look in on like some of the creative strategy that we're, we're running for some brands. Because I really do think that the more like diversity that you have when like going into this creative strategy research, the better. Most definitely. Yeah, I think there's so many different good points that you hit in there, but something that I really resonate with is ultimately how there can almost be individual owners of specific tasks you even have in that document that you had shown us. So like as a media buyer who might be more data inclined, it's like, mm -hmm. hey, let's look at the thumb stops. Let's look at the hooks and like, let's get that information. And then almost we can come together as a team for those who have looked at the different uh, like yeah, press releases and everything else along those lines. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So that's a little bit about research. Where I kind of want to shift now is within your video, you spoke about like the ideation and notion board to the start to figure out like, <laughs> what does that look and feel starting to look like? So I'm sure you want to jump in and share your screen again, but as I uh, am, yeah. I'm sure if not, but basically one of the questions that I see here that I think is really powerful is how do you find the balance between using your library of tried and true creative strategies while also keeping content and ideas unique and fresh? Yeah. So this is actually the part of the creative strategy research where like, that's why I like to begin with the research before I'm like sitting back and thinking like, oh, like which, cre which creatives have worked before. I like to start with the research because I actually think that that's where I get the initial angles and ideas that are perhaps a little bit more new than the tried and true, like tested creative. And yeah, Evan, if I can uh, share my screen a little bit, I Perfect. will like take you through some of these uh, documents that we have. And like, really, again, these are just so simple. It's almost a little embarrassing, but like, you know, the creative strategies to test, these are like the 10 creatives or so that we start off almost all of our clients on, but the way that we prioritize these are going to be completely different depending on the brand. Um, and 
Yeah. I mean, that's again, why I like doing the research first, because it can help me prioritize. I often find things like, oh, the stepwise are three reasons why I like, we generally test that like maybe towards the end. Cause that's not such an original idea or like TikTok made me buy it. Um, and because like we found like, oh, if we like do this research and find like really specific problem solution hooks that are a little more compelling, we tend to have a little bit better results with those. Um, yeah. And then we also have like this TikTok recipes one, which is like a very similar thing. Um, you're going to recognize a lot of them from the other one, like the, uh, like this problem solution. It was also in the like creative strategies to test document, but we have like, oh, TikTok made me buy it. TikTok response, stepwise, green screen ad. Like, I like having all of these just because last, it, I like having all these because I feel like the research portion of it is where I'm going to get inspiration for the messaging and the imagery. And then these menu items are like the formats then that I can smash that learning into. Um, and it just kind of like helps me get my creative ideas over the finish line, so to speak. Um, the other thing I've been using recently for like my ideation has been this app called Foreplay, which is where essentially you can save um, creatives. I actually use this for my YouTube channel a lot now to share with my editor. Um, Miguel, I think you've joined here. So, hey, what's up, my guy? <laughs> Um, but we, like, I save these all. And what's dope is like, if you've ever like copied something out of the Facebook ads library, sent it to a client or sent it internally, and it just wasn't there anymore. This saves all of the, um, all of the creatives like forever. And I can also download them as MP4s. So like, I have a few different ways that I've been doing this recently, but I think it is important just to like, not only track like formats that you think are compelling and where you'd like to start off with, but also track the ones that are just winning. So that when you do this research and um, you figure out what type of imagery you want to use, you know, like sort of the outline or skeleton of like how you want to put all that messaging and imagery together. I love that you brought up um, Addison and foreplay or whatever we want to call it into this mix. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because even as we talk about like that look and feel to keep it nice and fresh, like one of the questions that pops up here is like, especially with client brands that are very unique with their offering, what are some ways that you can actually go out and find um, competitors for a brand to be able to generate uh, that inspiration? Yeah. I also, I normally just like to take a step back here. Like, and instead of like finding direct competitors for your brand, I like to think, okay, like if, if I have a brand that's in the health and wellness space, like you can just look for like big brands in the health and wellness space to model, to model yourself after. I also like thinking about just like industry leaders or like platform leaders. So even though like I've worked with a number of brands like coffee brands and CPG or consumer product goods. And what's interesting is a lot of times like I wouldn't just look at what other coffee competitors were doing. I'd look at things like um, what Magic Spoon were doing or like whatever big like whatever big drink brands were doing. So I think that you don't always have to have direct competitors for this, but I would often zoom out to look at what other big industry leaders were doing as well as what other platform leaders were doing. Love that. Love that. And then in your world now, when we talk about, because again, talk about the thesis experience, of course, but for everyone <laughs> out there, there's a question that kind of pops in that's related to like actually sourcing creatives. So something that pops up right here is what's the best way to source creatives from Meta, TikTok, Snap, related to in-house production? What's the most efficient way to produce them? Oh, goodness. What is the best way to source creatives for, right. So I'd say right now, like at Thesis, we've done everything. We've used all the platforms, right? We, we use B-roll for a while. We use hashtag paid. I've tried Zillow. Um, and the reality is, is that like with all of those platforms, I always felt like I figured out the creators who had the most traction um, after like maybe 10 creators or so. So if you are just beginning and you don't have much bandwidth, use one of those third-party solutions. It's a totally fine place to start. But if you are starting to scale and want to build like a creator, creative content flywheel, I really do think that going to the platform specifically that you want to create content for is the best 
place to do that. So right now we've actually hired on a full-time UGC producer at Thesis. Her name's Maya. She's amazing. And for a majority of the brands that we're sourcing creators for right now, she's going directly to TikTok and finding the creators that make sense for that niche. She's going directly to Instagram and finding the best creators for that. Um, and I'd say that since we moved more towards this, what I would call holistic sourcing of creators, our content has gotten a lot better. And that is in huge, like, you know, and, and that's like a huge shout out for, for our girl, Maya, because she's just really taken that program and started to scale it up, which is amazing to see. Love that. Love that. And then now that we've done things like all of the research that's ultimately required, we've started to, to figure out what that look and feel needs to be. There's that next step of how do we start translating this information uh, to other teams? And usually what that means is in sort of some sort of like briefing method. So one of the, uh, the top yeah. voted questions now here, I'll give you a chance to read it too, but it's like, how do you write creative brief, uh, creative briefs from different ad formats, solo UGC, compilation, static, et cetera, uh, modular approach or individually write each. And then you can talk about briefing in general. I'm sure everyone would love to hear about that. Yeah, of course. So I would say that at Thesis, like right now, when we are actually delivering like what we call a ticketing system to our video editors. So like if we have a UGC or a compilation or like a features point out ad, we're just doing all that work in Asana. And I'm not going to lie, like it is just like really simple, like. I would show it to you guys, but it's literally just like a paragraph description of like what we want the ad to look like and like links to the links to the actual asset. Like it's pretty simple. I'd say where it's perhaps more interesting is how we brief our creators because I do think that that is probably the most important briefing process that we have. So Evan, if you want me to share my screen, I will show you guys how we um, create these UGC briefs at Let's Thesis. Let's do it, let's um, do it. And that also ties yeah. into Mateo's question related to UGC scripts, oh, like how much information yeah. are you giving? So yeah. two and one there. <laughs> I'm like half hoping some people from Thesis are not on this. Uh, <laughs> this AMA because they're gonna be like what the heck um so this is like a UGC brief that like we use at thesis I also use for like my external clients and you'll see like right here this is just a lot of like need to know information what's the client when's the deadline shipping details client overview website Instagram target demo um always very important to have your creative pack package specification and you'll see right here hmm no editing required this is what I tend to do not only for consulting clients but also for, um, for all of our um, brands at Thesis. But really like what we do is we create modular content or what I would like to call like super simplified modular content, which is where we essentially have the creators take a testimonial, which can either be like selfie or medium length or even long length and um, tons of B-roll because we found that like what we actually need the creators for are their image, frankly, and also to create a library of content. Like we already have video editors on deck, so we don't really need them to create the content. And we actually find that by creating this type of what I would call simplified modular content, we're able to test out multiple different strategies um, instead of just like having one video from one creator. Now, I do like to provide a sample script, which is pretty simple slide, you know, have like an engaging hook, have a problem agitator, introduce the product, do benefits testimonials reel, and then have a catchy CTA. Um, I generally provide a sample script and sometimes for these, I don't have it here. What we'll do is we'll actually have that, um, we'll have that framework written out and we'll list multiple options that they have. So for some clients, yeah, we are going to give them an exact script to write that is that I, we're going to give them exact script that we want them to recite. Um, for some of our clients, we just have super strict guidelines and we have to stick to that. Um, but other times, like I really do encourage creators to sort of pick and choose the points that feel most authentic for them. And I see someone just um, ask the question, what is B-roll? B-roll is just simply content that is um, being shot by someone that doesn't necessarily include like a speaking point. So you can have like a B-roll clip of someone drinking water or of someone doing like exercise like there was on the uh, break that I showed you guys, but they're not actually a talking point. So that B-roll can really fit in anywhere inside of the asset. 
Perfect. And with that information, like related to briefs, this also melds with the question we got earlier, like related to what the brand knows versus what you see in the world and what it's actually telling you. But a question that we see right here is yourself, a creative strategy expert. Do you mm -hmm. let clients have their say on these scripts that you're showing us today, casting or local localization, I mean, or are they really leaning on you? Too. Yeah. Like, so like I, when we work in a client facing industry, like some clients, like some clients need to ha have their check mark on every single thing. And that's okay. Like I said, we work with the, we are ultimately providing a service to clients. However, there are some clients that we've worked with for a while or that we have so much built up trust with that they're like, you choose the script for this month. You choose the creators for this month and go with it. Um, and spoiler alert, those <laughs> tend to be like really fun and well-performing clients. Um, but, you know, like we, we have both and we have to uh, account for both in our workflow. Awesome. And when you were like, again, working with brands on this and then leading this yourself before Maya came into your world, whether it be like UGC creator based or just team member based, what are some key traits that you look for in a good hire or contractor that might be a good fit for you? I always look for people who have a passion for mobile first content or social media strategy or just have even the feigned interest in advertising. It's kind of hard to find. Um, and I think that people who are passionate about um, being a creator themselves, like those are the unicorns. Like I wish that I could hire more creators um, for my team because those people look at the sort of briefs or the sort of problem that we have at hand with a client and they think about it really problem solution oriented. And they really think, hey, how can I like communicate to their customers like on this platform in a way that's gonna be engaging? It's really hard. Like I'm technically a creator for YouTube for founders and media buyers. And like, I don't always do it right, but like it's, I, I just find that, you know in hiring other creators for this type of role, it's the cheat code to be honest, like mm. they just like get it a little bit more. <laughs> Entirely. And just for everybody's like knowledge, we're 36 minutes in here with some great questions and where we finally gotten to is like the brief. So you see how much that research can give us the, the look at oh, yes. briefing <laughs> teams, right? But yeah. Madara, we have a lot of questions here related to like more of the media buying end and like understanding when is Let's something. Get I'll get to in. those questions. Yeah. yeah. So so I guess to like set the stage for everybody, what's your relationship as of right now looking like with the media buyers? And how do you work oh, together? Yeah. So right now I'm I technically oversee all of the ad, the ad creative team. So we we have four at Thesis right now. We have the studio team in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. We have the post-production team full of video editors, motion graphic artists, graphic designers. We have the um, creative strategist division with uh, like creative strategists and creative directors. And then, oh God, the UGC division, Maya, yes. <laughs> um, so like my relationship now with media buyers is really, frankly, to be their support line to get them better performance on the ad platforms. So right now, like my, cause like I'm a, like, I'm a growth person at the end of the day. Like right. I used to be a media buyer full time. I used to be a director of growth and I've realized as I moved into my new role that like my, the, the best value I could provide was to sort of take the creative problem off the shoulders of the media buyer. So that's what I've tried to do. But in order to do that properly, you really have to be, you have to really be collaborative and you have to like extract the learnings from the media buyers as well. So I, I view it and I view it like super collaboratively. Um, but really I'm just trying to enable the media buyers to, to do the best job that they can with those ad accounts. Cause it is a hard job. And I've been in the position of having to constantly think about performance. Is this ad getting the row as it's supposed to? Oh my God, it's not like, what other creative ideas do, do I have to do? But I have to optimize this ad set today. I have to like get this sort of ROI, like performance and cash is always on the shoulders of the media buyer and creative is the biggest lever I want to solve for the creative solution so that the, so the media buyers can take a fucking breath, frankly. <laughs> I love it. That's the harmony, right? Like that's the harmony yeah. you're creating at that point. Trying. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's like not always simple, but 
like the media buyer job is hard and no one understands it. If you're not a media buyer, you've never been a media buyer, like you don't get it. And I think the good part is you have the empathy of to have been in the shoes like myself and all honesty, like I know that job, what it entails, and especially if you're managing clients on top of that, you get to do a lot of that work, right? So Well, it's so hard too, because like we just expect way too much from our media buyers. We expect them to own the client relationship. We expect them to own the performance and sometimes to the tune of like, millions and millions of dollars, make that ROI, make that money. And like also be in charge of the creative and also just like, and do all the reporting, do all the bullshit. Like it is a wildly misunderstood job. And what I've tried to do at Thesis is like make it a little bit more palatable and like draw clear lines where like, you know, now media buyers can have like a sense of like work-life balance. Because to date, like they just haven't. It's crazy. Right, and you're getting love in the chat for that one, especially especially with Q4 here, <laughs> yeah. right? And I, and yeah, it's so Q4. it's so interesting because there's so many hats that they wear, and it's just like what you've done is taken some of those hats and say like I've got your back at the end of the day, right? And just jumping back into these questions here as I share my screen, oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the most upvoted question that we're seeing now, and I'm, I don't know how much you talk into this in your world, but I know you have the experience to chat about it here. But this question is asking, how many impressions should be reached before extracting wind in combination ad IDs from DCTs, DCOs, DCAs, whatever we oh, call God. it? I, I don't think about my media buying that way at all. <laughs> I, I know that like this is going to upset some people, but in, number one, it's different brand to brand. And what I really look at instead is like, okay, how much spend has gone through this ad? Like it has it scaled, has it scaled in comparison to your other winning ads? Has it scaled in comparison to your, your other core campaigns? Like if it's making money and you know, if, if it's making money and it's a true competitor or contender for the other winning ads that you have in the account, like scale that thing up, copy those post IDs, get it in. But in terms of like number of impressions, I really don't look at that to give you guys like hard numbers and something super tactical, tact like tactical, because that's the kind of stuff I would have wanted as a new media buyer. Say I have a brand that's spending a hundred K per month and I am spending anywhere from 200 to $400 a day on a new, um, testing creative. Oh, if it starts to, if I've, put like 5k through spend and it's still going and it's still a contender, then absolutely like let's push that into the core campaign. Anywhere from 2k to 5k. It really depends. But like, I don't know. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> well, it just depends I, so much. I think about it the same way. It's like a, it's a statistical significance thing at the end of the day, right? It's just like, have we spent enough to deem this relevant at this yeah. point? Um, so that part, and I think just like as a quick, as a quick, we have to give everyone the shout out because we see people upvoting it. Dar, you see the number one question that's come up now. Aww, so it's just some love you. from the people. It's just some <laughs> love for the people. Um, and then now that we have this love, let's translate it just into now on top of impressions and kind of moving that over to a spend and statistical significance. Um, a little bit deeper here, questions that I saw throughout is mainly related to like, how do you assess performance data after your ads have been live for, the question is a week, but that's this statistically relevant point. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a performance marketer. I want that cash money. So I am going to be looking at the creatives that have got the most amount of spend first. Sorry, sorry, most amount of spend and the most amount of purchases. Those are the two things that are always going to be my guiding light. What's right. getting the most amount of purchases? What's getting the most amount of spend? But I'm also going to be taking a step back and looking at what I like to call secondary metrics to actually analyze why they're working. And those that's primarily going to be hook rate. So what, like, what type of imagery and messaging is actually hooking those initial users? And then hold rate. This metric is going to tell me, hey, what type of editing styles and what type of uh, messaging and imagery is actually retaining those users? Another metric I've been looking at a lot more recently is average like viewer duration or like the average amount of time that people are watching the video. Because um, I recently um, realized that the hold rate metric, which I just did a video about earlier this week, was kind of flawed because a through play, which is what the hold rate metric is based on, is triggered when you watch up to 15 seconds of an ad or if your ad is under 15 seconds the user just has to watch the entire thing so this means that a hold like a hold rate could be triggered if someone watched a three second ad 
and like a seven second or like 10 second ad, which is actually a hugely different thing. So that's why I'm always trying to cross analyze that now with the average view, like duration or the average time that like someone is watching a video. Um, And really those secondary metrics just tell me the why. This is the storytelling. This is when I get on a call with a client and they're like, okay, why did this creative work? So then I jump into how did we hook them? What's the messagery? What's like the messagery, (laughs) which is the (laughs) messagery and imagery. And then, you know, how did we hold them? And like, ultimately like what I'm zoning in on in those things too is like it's about consumer psychology like what do what is in the hook or like what is in the hold that is like really speaking to their deepest fears their wants as like a human like it's kind of like like I kind of used to consider that stuff like fluff frankly Mm. as like a performance person but I've found more recently when I'm analyzing creatives that work like that's actually the story that I'm telling a lot of times I love that that ties back right to the research being the most important oh, yes. part, right? Like <laughs> yes. That's really what it is. It's like you've done all of that work. Now the hook has come to life and it matches what you've built before that. So all of it coming together is the perfect story at the end of the day. Uh, and now that, we, now that we've gone to a point where we're continuing to look at data, a question that Tom has here is like, okay, creatives go live. You've tested for however long. Now you have your results. What does the process look like moving forwards related to your winner and losers? Okay, cool. So once you have the results and you're like, hey, I'm ready to kill and scale, turn off the ones that don't work. But also like we're docu, we have to like document that behind the scenes. I will admit that this is something that like at Thesis we're really working on to try and improve on. But like when you get those learnings, document them. I don't really care where it is in a Word doc in an Excel sheet. But then as far as like tactical, actual media buying next steps, what are we doing? We're turning off the losers in the ad account. We're making a note on whether or not we want to improve something, right? And then we are taking the winning creatives from the testing campaign or the testing ad sets, and we're distributing them to our retargeting campaign and to our core prospecting campaign so that they can scale up in other audiences. Love that. And then obviously after that, you're going to be launching, well, you're going to be creating net new concepts that can then go live, of course. But is there ever, and I don't know if this exists, or Talk to me if that's wrong, first of all. But then the second thing is, is there ever a ratio between like net new things that you'll create versus, hey, in the account, we can make a small change to three seconds and make those smaller iterations? Oh, yeah. Like actually when we're building out our creative roadmaps for clients, we're really dividing the concepts between iterative creatives or net new creatives. And it's going to depend client to client whether or not we're like doubling down on just completely net new like content or um, iterative content. I will say when we onboard clients, traditionally, um, we generally start off with iterations just because I'm going to be honest, like every time I get on a like client onboarding call and I showed them that slide deck that I showed you guys earlier, and I'm like three to four weeks to see new creatives, um, I always get a message after that call and they're like, no, we need it now. And what we always end up doing is making some Frankenstein type of content where we take like the assets that had the best hooks and combine them with the best holds. And like, Mm. that's an iterative concept. Entirely, entirely. I love that. Um, Okay, one of the other questions that I saw in here, I just wanted to make it more relevant to the time that we're in is BFCM. Like it's right around the corner at the end of the day and then the holidays right after that, right? So something here and like, first we need to fact check that it's actually correct. But one of the questions that we have is like last year for BFCM, you had mentioned how you had to spend up to 40 to 60K. Can you explain when you look for or what you look for and do, and do during these intense spikes in spend in the account? So making sure yeah, that so, like, you don't kill performance overnight. Yeah, so this was not actually last Black Friday, Cyber Monday. This is the Black Friday, Cyber Monday before this. I actually, um, I vlogged that Black Friday, Cyber Monday. The real OGs would remember that like vlog that I did in 2020. It was wild. But yeah, I had a client that like wanted to spend a million that week, um, that weekend, and it was crazy. But like the things that I was looking for were honestly like the ad sets that were getting the best, like the most amount of purchases, like for the best price. And we were just scaling those up. And like, it, it sounds a little like counterintuitive, actually, mm-hmm. but it was way more intuitive than like process oriented, like you see the results, 
you increase the spend. You see results going down, you decrease the spend. Like I really wish there was like some deep in-depth process I had, but I really didn't. <laughs> Especially when you have to move that quickly. It's like you follow the performance. Entirely. Entirely, especially within like such tight time frames, like when the actual event comes up and it's really, literally you're rocking on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and whatever it might be, you have to move quickly at the end of the day, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I know like a lot of times people want like a system for scaling. Um, and when you're first starting off and you have those like under 10K per month budgets, like, yeah, don't, uh, don't scale above 20% on any given day. Like definitely like don't rock the boat too much. But for those bigger account spends, like you just, it's a little more art than science, which I know is another question. So, you know, like it is what it is. Entirely, entirely. And then one of the other things, so the question that exists here is saying, how do you determine whether a creative is worth testing or not? Now, oh, I feel yeah. like, yeah, you could jump in with that one. But what I'd also love if you could tack on to is, is there ever any a situation where there's a creative developed, whether it came from a UGC creator or whatever it might be, and you're like, that's not it. We can't go live. Like, it's not worth it at that point. So talk to us about yeah. both, potentially. Yeah. So, God, I love this question because, again, I really do feel like for a while as performance creators, we've all had this ethos of just like, let's just test everything and see what works. And like, we really don't know. Now I find myself a lot more being like, like challenging my creative teams and be like, what are we trying to learn from this test? Like, if you don't know what you're trying to learn from a specific test, then you shouldn't be running it. And if we're not like extracting real, if we're not extracting like certain variables for certain tests and we're just like, doing things willy nilly, like that's when I get really nervous and I start pushing back on people. Um, so I guess like to button that up nicely is if you don't have a reason for testing a creative and if you are not going to learn something from testing it, then you probably shouldn't be testing it. Mm, so interesting because even with that in mind, with the creative that we're working on, um, that's one side of the equation, right? So this almost leads yeah. to this question that I saw somewhere. I think it's a little bit deeper that it started plugging in, but it's related to landing pages. Cause one mm -hmm. side of the equation is you're making some amazing creatives that are driving yeah. people exactly where we want or exactly where media buyers want them to go. Right. And then one of the questions that somebody has here is like, should they test multiple landing pages on yes. the same ad creative? Yes. It will make a huge difference. Now, something that's kind of controversial that we like believe at Thesis is that like there doesn't really have to be landing page to add or like add creative to landing page like continuity. Like mm. I think that's a really big um, like myth is that you have to have matching ad creative to matching landing page. And like sometimes I have seen it work and the case for it is compelling, especially if you have like a press hit ad um, where you're not mentioning the press then in your landing page, like that could be kind of confusing as a user, but like, I don't think that you have to match the headline of your like creative to the headline that's going to be in your landing page. Like you're actually, I think going to be able to test the most and like have the most potential for actually increasing your sales. If you take a step back and actually try to develop more scalable, like creative that could fit anywhere. Um, or that could fit like multiple landing pages and also like create landing page content that is just like a little bit more broad, so to speak. I don't love how I'm answering this, but it's like, <laughs> yeah, I don't think that that continuity needs to like be completely buttoned up. Um, and I think that you would actually get a lot more traction out of trying different types of formats on LPs. Like secret thesis thing we have like three main formats that we are testing on our lps their quizzes their listicles or like advertorials and their overview style pages and that's kind of it now if you haven't tested like one of those three you probably should if you haven't tested like sending your ad content to the product page try it i'm skeptical whatever or not it's going to work in 2022 <laughs> you should also try sending it to a collection page try sending it to your home page like I just like, it's a complete like false idea that like anyone, including myself could step into a business and be like, these are all the things that you need to do. And immediately you're going to get the performance you want. You right. have to test everything. 
So like that, yeah, I don't know. That's also like what I try and do in my videos too, is just like give you guys like a shit ton of things to test and like, hopefully something will hit. <laughs> Yeah, and at this point, Dara, we've come to the last seven minutes of the video. Now, I've plucked out a couple questions where people are just looking for general advice, but also yeah. no pressure. We can do that, or we can kind of just scroll through to see if there's anything that pops out to you. You have a preference? I'd like to throw it into your court with this last little bit of time. Um, preference? Like, let's just, just pick out any question. Give me some wild cards, too. Give me something <laughs> juicy. I don't know how I feel about all the juicy, juicy ones, but like, yeah, I want the <laughs> you can see a couple right at the top here. That it's you can media kind of buying choose dead. From yes, you. it is a little bit. It's, it's having a bit of a death rattle. It's, it's just not how it was a few years ago. If you are focusing on testing the audiences more than you are on your creatives, that's like a bad sign, I'd say. But like the media buyer, I think still, like the media buyer will still be needed. They really will. Like, a, and, and I have framed myself to think of them less as media buyers and more as like technical growth experts. Mm. Like they're the people who know how to push the right buttons and do all the technical things behind the scenes. Like sometimes people ask me about like how to set up Cappy and like how to set up their business manager. And like, I don't know how to do that, you know? like. I still like look at our media buyers and I'm like, I don't know what that means. Like I need help with that. There's still going to be a need for people who know how to push the right buttons, but like they have to still have like a big context for the creative side. Love it. And a question that someone else had, and I just want to make it a little bit more general here. It's like this creative, creative strategy style role, like as new as it is, there's a lot of people who could potentially transition into this, right? Like there's a creative producer, there are the like media buyers themselves. Like what are some recommendations you have for anyone else who is uh, turning into a creative strategist? Oh goodness. Like suggestions I would have for, for creative strategists is like, you kind of have to champion the creative strategy process. Um, you're going to have to be the person who's asking the questions about what's performed before, um, and really developing your own framework. I think more than anything, creative strategy is a framework. And mm. if you can like speak more to that framework and be the champion of that, like that's going to be really valuable. And that's how I can see more media buyers like pushing themselves into the role of a creative strategist. We also have video editors who are starting to become creative strategists at Thesis, which is really cool to see. Um, and that's really like from that side of like the execution side of like people who just want to step up and like learn more about like how to actually create performance growth content. And that's been really cool to see at Thesis as well. So how do you, how do you start training those people up? Um, a lot of it is like, frankly, like getting them like now inside of motion, like since mm. we've started using motion is like really put it, being able to put the data into their hands and like getting them to think a little bit more analytical and like still like keeping their creative brain, but like forcing it to think more about the numbers and like how the content that they make can actually have like really big, like dollars difference, which is kind of cool. Yeah, especially putting, I talk to creative teams every single day. And like one of the things they ask is, hey, I made something, how'd it do? So that general check mark, uh, but it's also yes. like, now that you know how it did, it's like, oh my gosh, you made a huge impact. Like, isn't that great? Like you can continue to do that as that's long as you know the, the formula. That's like the dopest thing about our industry is like, I've worked on brand marketing teams before. And I actually used to, like my first job in advertising was I worked as like an account manager in Cairo, Egypt, actually. No um, for an advertising agency out there, I was doing organic social media. So I was, um, like creating, I was like doing photo shoots and video shoots for like brands in Cairo. And I would just like make their like Instagram, like content essentially. And um, like, what's crazy is like, that was really fun and really creative. But now like I get to actually have like a big impact on a brand's bottom line. Like the, I know that the content that I make is going to make money, which is very fun and like what we're all about. So like, yeah, like I think that that's just really empowering as like a marketer and like as a professional.
I love that. I love that so, so much. Um, and then I think like the last question that I wanted to ask for our time today is really just bring it back to that process because that is oh, the yeah. piece that that strategist will start to, to really own. So in your world, is there a typical cadence that you're following as you go through this creative strategy process that you've outlined, outlined to us all today? Like a typical cadence? I mean... I would say the creative strategy research generally probably lasts a week. I like to let people sit with what they've learned and have internal brainstorms and throw ideas off of one another. Um, the expectation I try to set with clients is three to four weeks until you see your creatives so that like we can work out some like kinks on our back end and also get you to buy into our creative roadmap that doesn't always happen because people like want things now. Um, so like I'd say like once we zoom out of onboarding, like the, during that time period, we try to deliver content and creatives to our clients every single week. I think that mm. for a brand spending anywhere from like 50 to a hundred, like if you spend more than 50 K per month on your paid social ads, you should be testing one new creative per week. If you're spending more than 200 K, you should probably be spending, like, you should probably be testing anywhere from like two to four new creatives per week. And like, I've worked with brands that are spending a million dollars per month on their Facebook and Instagram. And like, yeah, they were testing like six. So it's, uh, you know, the more money, like more money, more problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it folks. Everybody, we've gone through this yeah. entire journey <laughs> talking about creative strategy, like talking about the research, how important it is, the look and feel, your briefing, your analyzing, and of course, just general advice from Dara and the amazing brain she has. And then most importantly, tying it back to just creative strategy and that workflow at the end of things. Um, Dara, any last words for the people that you might have to sign us off here? No, just thank you to every like thanks to everyone so much for joining. It's been awesome like seeing the chats like light up and um I just, I don't know. I just like really appreciate everyone's support. Like you're the reason why I make content and I'm looking forward to like getting to know y'all even better over the next few weeks and months and forever while I make this content. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Dara. Thank you so much for, for letting us be a part of this. Everyone who's here, whether it be on Zoom or YouTube, love to have you here. Like I said, the recording will be going out and additional information. I hope everyone has an amazing day. And let's give a round of applause for Dara, throwing your emojis, all that good stuff. It's been absolutely Thanks, incredible. Thanks, everyone. Absolutely incredible. We will be sending some of the documents you've seen in this via email. And if you didn't sign up via email and you were on my YouTube, um, I'll give you guys a link in this. Uh, I'll drop a link in the comments section on the on the YouTube live. So we'll see you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Appreciate Bye. you all. Talk to you all soon. See ya.